here where the machines are. This is the top. Supply right. This is where the power comes in. Yeah. That controls the motor. Cooling and then the motor itself. That's on this. You can see the cables right here? Yeah. They go into uh, yeah. yeah. And, and then, then there's, there's the rope. Drive shift. That shaft. Yep. A bit drop down right there. Yeah. Oh look, here it goes. Inside the Inside of this casing, there's a bunch of magnets. No gears. And then each one of these brakes goes to 150%. Oh, the popping noise. That's the brake dropping. Oh. So the brakes only hold the elevator. They don't stop it. Oh. The motor stops it. Yeah. Unless it's an emergency. Unless it's an emergency. Yeah. So we have a sock clip. If I'm working on it, if I was to flip this, it would shut up. Yeah. Right now it would shut up. So if you're Every in there, it would be a hard stop. Every element in this building. Older buildings don't have that. All the emergency oh. shut off switches. This is all the controls for elevator. Oh, wow. This one's moving. Open this one up. Just don't touch that. See, this is all the wires it takes to run a single elevator. You hear all the clicks in there too. And then we had other crews setting all these. Because these all come in pieces. Everything from, from this point up is all just in pieces. These all get cranked up. And these got cranked up before the building. Halfway built, they left half the building off. And then we had to come up with it all open about five or six floors, nothing below us. And then the crane would bring them in and we'd have to weld them down and then plastic over them to keep them weather until the building got built. And everything behind is to drive. It controls all the high voltage. And then the circuit boards is just all the low voltage. So they use the low voltage. 
I guess going up now. The cables were connected to the top of the crossing, we call it, where the okay. cables were. These ends are right here. Look over here. Yeah. So the ends of the cable. Yeah. And then they go down. They go around a big shiv, like a wheel on the top of the elevator, they come back up, they go around, and there's a, let's see on this one more better. There's a, it's called a deflector shoe, and that kind of takes it to the back of the raceway, but it goes around twice, a double wrap, and it gives traction so that they don't slip. Yeah, yeah. hence the term, traction elevator. And this right here tells the controller what direction it's spinning, and how fast it's going, and that has Here it goes. The computer compares this one to that one, and they have to match direction and speed. Because if for whatever reason this one is saying it's spinning and that one is not, it'll shut off. Okay. There's something wrong. And this is the brain, all the dispatching. This is where all the buttons connect and all the building security. Everything covered is stuff that we had to hook up. Yeah. All of this stuff is your your fire alarm system, all the building fire alarms, and all the smoke detectors in here will recall the elevators to the bottom floor. And this controller controls all elevators. All the buttons in the hallways, uh, we call destination dispatch. They all come back to this. This is a nickel. Not worth much these days. But to a Mitsubishi electric service engineer, it is a valuable tool for checking the smooth operation of their elevator cars while they're in motion. By standing the coin on its side on the floor of the car, the nickel test checks for excessive sway or motion while the elevator is moving. If the coin falls over, there is too much movement and further adjustments are necessary coin remains standing, you can be certain of a smooth ride. My day with Mitsubishi Electric just keeps getting better as I am being treated to a delicious lunch with my very special host, Eric Zomers, the senior vice president of the entire Mitsubishi Electric Elevators and Escalators United States. And I had a few questions for him. Okay. What was your most challenging project you have done? Um, we like challenging projects. Like, uh, let's see, we put a spiral escalator into the world's biggest Starbucks in Chicago. So it's a 40, about a 40,000 square foot, four level Starbucks um, in downtown Chicago, and that was exciting. And I don't know if you've had a chance to ride one of our spiral escalators yet. No, but I actually had a question about them. How does that work? That seems like amazing technology. How did you make that happen? Well, the fact that you realize it's amazing technology, that's pretty astute because um, I think a lot of times people don't realize how complicated they are. You know how on a regular escalator, the step is shaped like this? It's a rectangle, right? Yes. So with a spiral escalator, you, it's like a trapezoid shape. So the inside of the mm -hmm. step is narrower than the outside of the step as it rotates around. That's how you have the smaller radius on the inside and the longer radius on the outside. And kind of a funny fact about the spiral escalator is that if you're standing on the outside of the spec, outside of the step, you're at, your velocity is actually faster than if you stand on the inside of the step. Because you're traveling a longer distance in the same amount of time. So you're actually going faster on the outside step than on the inside step. But there's a lot of interesting technology. It's you know it's as much about precision engineering as it is about um, the technology behind it. it ha everything has to be so precise 
And when we install these, we have a factory supervisor, engineering supervisor, come and watch over the installation to make sure that every component is installed exactly where it needs to be. So precision is really probably the key ingredient to the spiral escalator. Is that your project that you're most proud of? Good question, boy. So many projects I'm most proud of, you know. Um, I, have to, I have to say more than one. You know, the first building we ever did in the U.S. was called the Hotel Nico in San Francisco. And here what we are, year? 30, well, it was installed in 1986. And so we are 36 years later and the equipment is still running well. You know? um, yeah, so they're very well maintained. Exactly, yeah. Well manufactured, well engineered, and then well maintained. And then um, we also did the elevators at the uh, Apple headquarters. Cupertino. Yeah, I know the Steve Jobs Theater. Yep, Steve Jobs Theater. The, and the turning one. Oh, you've seen that? It's awesome. I've yeah. seen it on video. I can't actually go into Apple <laughs> Park though. It's hard to get into the app. They're very secure. But yeah. you're right. The rotating unit, and then also the space. What they call the spaceship in the the main building as yeah. well. We did. Um, of an all-around glass elevator also at the Broad Museum downtown oh, Los Angeles. Oh, I went there. You went there. I saw that on your, on yeah. your post. You said at the time, I think you might have said it was the coolest elevator that you'd ridden on. Yeah, the best <laughs> elevator I've ever ridden. So what like, type of education does it take to become an engineer for Mitsubishi? So if you want to um, work in the engineering group, yes. then... A typical engineering degree, a mechanical degree, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, structural engineering are kind of the primary degrees that that we would look for. Of course, we like anybody technical, so anybody that's good at math or a math major, and ultimately it's anybody who's who's a hard worker, who's humble, and and dedicated to doing the job right. They can they can be successful at our company. Well, thank you for your time. I really enjoyed my day with you and Matt. Thank you, Mitsubishi Electric, for this fascinating inside look and your extraordinary hospitality. I'll remember this day forever. And thank you to everyone watching. Please take a moment to like and subscribe if you enjoyed. And leave a comment in case you have any questions. See ya.